The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. This is a video Bible reading presentation on the book of Acts. Today we'll be starting the book of Acts, looking at some introductory material as well as the first several verses of the book of Acts in our Christian Bible. The book of Acts is a brief account of the first 30 years of the church and of the spread of the Christian faith. Now, Christian Bible is a collection of 66 short books that record God's message for humanity. From the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 and 1, through the present time and until the end of the world in Revelation 22:20, The Bible is divided into two major parts. There are 39 books in what Christians call the Old Testament that were originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic over a period of several thousand years. And then there are 27 books that were originally written in the Greek language over a period of 50 or 60 years, which Christians know as the New Testament. The New Testament is focused on the work and the message of Jesus and the church that he built. Two of the books in the New Testament, adding up to a bit more than a fourth of the entire content of the New Testament, were written by a man named Luke. Luke's first volume is the Gospel called Luke, which tells of Jesus' birth, his preaching, his teaching, his miracles, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. After writing the Gospel, Luke then wrote a second volume called the Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, which highlights the Lord's work through his chosen apostles over a period of about 30 years, beginning with the resurrection of Jesus in the spring, probably of 33 AD, and continuing through the church's growth westward from Jerusalem to Rome in the early 60s of the first century AD. The Gospel of Luke was written first, and then the book of Acts. Because of what is included in Acts and where the story ends, we can determine that Acts was written about 30 years after the church started, in about 62 AD. This means, among other things, that the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were written while many eyewitnesses of what was recorded there were still alive and able to verify the accounts. When we open our Bible to the first page of the book of Acts and consider the first line, we read in Acts 1.1, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So we see from the very first line a clear statement that Acts continues the story that was begun in a previous book. As we look to the Gospel of Luke in our New Testament, we read this in the first four verses. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, reading from the New International Version. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. There is no question that the same author wrote Luke and Acts. We have the opening statements of the two volumes, naming the same original recipient, an individual addressed as most excellent, which suggests that he may have been a governing official. His name was Theophilus, and that name Theophilus means lover of God. Based on the remarks in Luke 1.4, this Theophilus seems to have been someone who had already been taught the Christian faith. Luke's stated goal there in those first four verses of the Gospel of Luke was to provide an orderly account, not necessarily entirely chronological, but a systematic account of the things that Jesus had done and the things then in the book of Acts that continued to be done in the name of Jesus. Luke's stated purpose was to provide certainty about his faith for the reader. In much of what Luke wrote, he did not claim to be an eyewitness or a participant. He mentioned those who were eyewitnesses from the first, 
in Luke chapter 1 and verse 2. And he wrote in Luke 1 verse 3 that he himself had carefully investigated everything. He had followed these things from the beginning. In fact, Luke is proven to be an excellent historian, an excellent geographer, an engaging storyteller, and in every way scrupulous about getting his facts right to the smallest detail. The author's name is not found in either the text of the Gospel of Luke nor in the book of Acts. But from the earliest times, in writings that we still have from the second century and onward by Christian disciples, Luke has always been acknowledged as the author of these two books. We know Luke's name in his own generation from Paul's letters in the New Testament. Luke was a close friend and a companion of the Apostle Paul. Luke was a Gentile, unlike Paul, who was a Jew. And he is mentioned by Paul as being of the uncircumcised, not a Jewish male. And he was trained as a doctor. Again, this is mentioned by Paul in Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14, where Paul is mentioning some of the people who were his fellow workers. And he describes Luke as being the beloved physician. Luke was a dear friend to Paul. He was a helper to Paul. He undoubtedly looked out, helped Paul, looked after him in some of his very challenging and difficult circumstances, as well as being a co-worker in preaching the gospel. When Paul's death as a martyr in the persecution that was instigated by the emperor Nero was imminent, Paul again mentioned Luke as his faithful and his only companion in Rome at the time he wrote his last letter, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me as he was asking Timothy to make haste to come and assist him, as well as to bring others who could help in the final work that Paul needed to do before his death. We have evidence from historical sources that Paul died by Nero's order in about 66 or 67 AD. This is an event that is not mentioned by Luke in Acts, which ends with Paul as a prisoner in Rome in about 62 AD. And so we can surmise reasonably that the death of Paul occurred some years after the close of the book of Acts. Luke sometimes includes himself as a participant in the events of the book of Acts, using the pronoun we instead of they, beginning in chapter 16, verses 9 and 10, when Luke first joined Paul's traveling company in Troas as a co-worker, as an evangelist who traveled with the expedition to preach in Macedonia. Luke may have been a resident of Troas when Paul arrived there, a town on the western coast of Asia Minor in modern Turkey. He may have been a member of the church there before he began to travel and to preach the gospel along with Paul, as described in Acts 16, verses 8 through 10. So we have these two volumes in our Bible. We have Luke, the gospel, and Acts, the account of the early days of the church, written by a scrupulous fact checker and careful researcher who was a physician who was a very effective preacher of the gospel, who was widely traveled and well-read, who was very skillful with words, and a beloved traveling companion and helper of the Apostle Paul. The book of Acts picks up right where the gospel of Luke left off, reminding the reader of Jesus' resurrection, of his multiple appearances to his disciples, and then his departure from this physical world after giving final instructions to his apostles. From there, the book of Acts tells the story of about 30 years of church expansion, organization, and service with miracles, guidance from the Holy Spirit, visions of angels, and a great deal of hard work and risk undertaken by those first Christians. The main human characters of Luke's account after Jesus ascended to heaven are Peter in the first 12 chapters and Paul in chapters 13 through 28. Those chapters that deal with Peter's preaching are centered on the early Jewish proclamation of the gospel. The first seven chapters are centered in Jerusalem and then outward from Jerusalem through Judea and to Samaria and finally to the Gentile world, with chapters 8 through 12 bridging the transition from the Jerusalem church to the church in the wider Gentile Roman world. This historical account Luke provided clarifies the background in practice of many doctrinal points taken for granted in other books of the New Testament, which were written by various other inspired men. Acts provides a link that is vital to our understanding of what the church did and what the church taught and what the church should do and teach. 
to understand the organization, the work, the message, the purpose of the church, we need the book of Acts. Acts shows us in many examples what disciples are meant to be and to do and to teach. Our consideration of the book of Acts will be an examination of what the apostolic church was and what the apostolic church did. In Acts chapter 1, we have the introduction to the second volume, the introduction to the sequel. We have a reminder and an affirmation of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. We have the reliability of that account, the fact that it was based on eyewitness testimony. We have instructions that were given by Jesus to his chosen apostles. We have the core group of devout believers in Jerusalem, those who followed Jesus faithfully after his resurrection and his ascension. And we have the selection of a new apostle to fill out the number of the 12 according to the plan and purpose of God. So looking to Acts chapter 1, in verses 1 through 5, we have the connection to the gospel story, we have the introduction to the continuing story of Jesus, and we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, in verses 1 through 5, reading this time from the New American Standard Version. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In this first verse, Luke again says, the first account I composed, Theophilus. The Gospel of Luke addressed to the same individual, apparently a Roman individual, a Roman official, apparently someone who has some background already in the Christian faith, was so that he could know the certainty of what he had been taught. That was what Luke had succinctly said back in the first few verses of the book of Luke. So the book of Acts is carrying on that intention to accurately inform the reader of the certainty of what has been taught about Jesus. Luke continues here in verse 1 about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Noticing that word began, what Jesus began to do. In other words, the Gospel of Luke doesn't tell the whole story. Jesus has died. He's been buried. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And yet his work continues. The gospel was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. But the book of Acts continues that story, continues that theme. Jesus was leaving in terms of his presence in the flesh. But he was not abandoning the work that he had started. His human life and ministry has had a beginning and was a beginning. But he continued to do and to teach through his chosen representatives. In the second verse, Luke says this was what Jesus did until the day when he was taken up to heaven. Jesus physically presented himself to his apostles, taught them, prepared them until the day when he was taken up, when they saw him ascend into heaven. Jesus' direct ministry ended when he ascended into heaven. This was a specific historical event in a specific geographical location on a specific day and time. After he had given the Holy Spirit, he, or rather after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. We have little summaries of those orders at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, at the end of the Gospel of Mark, at the end of the Gospel of Luke, at the end of the Gospel of John. And part of what Jesus ordered them to do is reported to us here also in these opening verses of the book of Acts. Jesus gave orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, I've already mentioned that major characters in the book of Acts include the apostles Peter and Paul. But the Holy Spirit himself is a tremendously important character in the book of Acts. He is a major character in the activities of the book of Acts. 
as he leads, as he guides, as he empowers miracles, as he provides evidence that Jesus indeed is the Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit in establishing the church and guiding the apostles is central to the book of Acts. Already Luke is calling our attention to the role of the Holy Spirit here in the second verse in chapter one, that the instructions Jesus gave the apostles were given through the Holy Spirit. In verse three, he says that these were given to those to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. The apostles were shown with certainty. There were many convincing proofs. They were left with no doubt whatsoever that the body of Jesus had been brought back to life, that he had come out of the grave, that he presented himself physically to them over a period of days, that the resurrection was real, that Jesus died and came out of the tomb alive in a resurrected body. They needed certainty that he died, that he was alive. And Luke assures us that the evidence was compelling. There were many convincing proofs, enough to direct these men, to drive these men, to lay down their lives for what they knew to be the truth about the living Lord Jesus Christ. These proofs, as Luke says, of the resurrection of Jesus occurred while he was appearing to them over a period of 40 days. The first day that Jesus appeared to his apostles was the day of his resurrection. It's recorded in the 28th chapter of Matthew, in the 16th chapter of Mark, and the 24th chapter of Luke, and the 20th and 21st chapters of the Gospel of John. The first day of the week, the day after the Jewish Sabbath, the day that we call Sunday, was Resurrection Day. That was the first day that he appeared to them. And since Luke says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, that would indicate that it was most likely a Thursday when Jesus ascended into heaven. It would have been six weeks after that final Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples when he instituted the Last Supper, as it's called, when he gave them instructions about commemorating his death by eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine, again, as reported in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So over a period of 40 days, almost six weeks, Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And then he ascended into heaven visibly before their very eyes. There were still, on the day when he went up, 10 more days until the rest of the divinely ordained pieces of the puzzle that God had composed from eternity would fall into place for the apostles to begin doing what Jesus had trained them to do. Now, the fact that God chose that Jesus was among them for 40 days is intended, as many other New Testament scriptures are, to connect us back into Old Testament types, antitypes, foreshadowings, and prophecies. There were several particular events in the Old Testament that occurred in 40-day intervals. Going back to the story of the flood in Genesis chapter 7, verses 4 and 12 and 17, we're told that God brought rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights to instigate the flood. In the eighth chapter of Genesis and verse six, we're told that Noah spent 40 days in the ark waiting for the flood waters to dissipate. In Exodus chapter 24 and verse 18, we're told that Moses went up on Mount Sinai and spent 40 days on Mount Sinai communing with God and receiving the law and the commandments, the 10 commandments that were written on tablets of stone. And then again, when Moses went back up on the mountain a second time to receive the 10 commandments engraved on stone after having broken the first set, in the 34th chapter of Exodus in verse 28, once again, Moses spent 40 days on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and verse 25, when the spies were sent into the land of Canaan in preparation for the invasion of the land by the Israelite people, for God to give the land to his people Israel, in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 25, they spent 40 days in spying out the land. In the story of David and Goliath in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, before David came on the scene and won the victory over Goliath, we're told that Goliath came out and challenged the armies of Israel, taunting them for 40 days. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 8, we're told that Elijah was strengthened by the angels of God and given food that carried him for a 40-day journey down to Horeb, down to Sinai, 
where he communicated again with God. In Jesus' story, we have 40 days as bookends of his ministry. His ministry began right after he was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, right after he was baptized, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And there for 40 days he did without food. He was fasting for 40 days and was tempted by the devil. And so that's the beginning of his ministry, his baptism by John in 40 days in the wilderness. And now at the conclusion of his ministry, again, there is the 40 days in which Jesus appears to his apostles, preparing them for the challenges that lay ahead. But God is drawing connections for us, connecting dots for us, as it were. Between these events in the Old Testament, such characters as Noah and Moses and Elijah and victories, such as that experienced by David, or those that the Israelites would receive when they went in faith into the promised land, drawing connections between those things as anticipations of the work of Jesus, and now the finality and the fulfillment of Jesus' doing everything that the Lord God had given him to do. Luke continues here in the third verse of Acts chapter 1, that Jesus during those 40 days was speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. And again, that's how his ministry began. After he had been in the wilderness for 40 days, tested by the devil and without food, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 43, he had come back into civilized areas. He was beginning to do his preaching of the gospel. And Jesus said of himself there in Luke 4, 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And the apostles had heard that teaching from the very beginning of his ministry, right up until the time he was taken up from them. But his message to them was about the kingdom of God, preparing for the church that was to come into being as a result of his shedding of blood and establishing a new covenant relationship. And then finally, in the, in the introductory comments here in the fourth verse of Acts chapter 1, Luke makes reference to Jesus gathering them together. He wanted all the apostles in one place for the final instructions that he would give them. The apostles were not constantly together in the first few weeks after Jesus' resurrection, as recounted in Luke 24 and as also recounted in John chapters 20 and 21, they had different concerns, different interests, and they went in different directions for a while. But Jesus wanted them all in the same place. He wanted them all to witness his ascension into heaven. He wanted them all to be in Jerusalem for the events that lay ahead. They needed to be together and in a place chosen by Jesus for their final instructions and preparation. The setting for these instructions was probably a meal, as the wording in the NIV indicates, Jesus had them together to eat with them. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, is the wording in the NIV, which indicated the intimacy and the certainty of the circumstances for the apostles. This wasn't the first time he brought them together and shared food with them. We also had instances in Luke chapter 24, verses 42 through 43, We have an instance in John chapter 21 by the Sea of Galilee. And we have Peter referring to that in Acts chapter 10, 41 in his testimony to Cornelius that Jesus had eaten with them during the days that he spent among them after his resurrection. So gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been foretold in the Hebrew prophets of the Old Testament as the place where God would reveal his word, his message for all nations. For example, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, Isaiah wrote, many people will come and say, that is to say, not just Jews, but people of all nations. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So they were to wait in Jerusalem, the place chosen by God in the Old Testament. The words that the prophets had indicated was going to be the place where the word would go forth for all the world, for all nations. And there the apostles, Jesus said, were to wait for what the Father, for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The second time in these few verses, Luke has mentioned the work of the Holy Spirit, what he did in and through Jesus and what he was about to do in and through the apostles. They were to wait in Jerusalem 
for what God had promised. What had God promised? God had promised the Holy Spirit. John's statement, as referenced by Jesus here, is found in Luke chapter 3 and verse 16, when he was saying to the crowds, I am not the Messiah, I am not the Christ, but one who comes after me is the Christ. And speaking of Jesus in Luke 3, 16, John answered and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he goes on to talk about the fact that judgment is entrusted to the one who was to come after him, the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, who was to come after him. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. According to Luke's summary, we can be very sure that the apostles really saw Jesus, really touched Jesus, really conversed with the resurrected Jesus, and were prepared specifically by him to be in the right place at the right time to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish the purposes of God. 